If you, uh, would you mind coming and sitting down in the lower amphitheater? Because, uh, you know, you've got to have a swivel head to look up there. Come down here, all of you. Come, come quickly, we're ready to start. and departments always uh, in Paris, in London, everywhere the fashion is, David is. And he, uh, his donator is responsible Thank you. For Come here. down here. There are seats right here. You'll sit next to our very famous uh, celebrity designer here. Okay? Are we ready or are we talking? Could I have your attention, everyone? We're ready to start. But that experience is priceless. He visited London in the 60s. foresight with creating a fashion business that when you graduate from a fashion school, you'll all be able to find a niche, a place to have a job, thanks to uh, especially the uh, guest speaker today is really, I, I just think he's fantastic, uh, and his brother too. Uh, 110 years ago, brothers Michael and Nicholas uh, as their great-grandmother, Mrs. Lena Bryant, uh, was found, founded the department store Lane Bryant. How many of you know the name Bryant? Be really on that, and uh, has been has made her name for eternity, Lane Bryant, and her great grandsons. When they uh, took over, uh, they said uh, uh, that they would. They took a survey across the country um, of uh, what this, uh, what what was the in an exciting, ever changing ever-challenging business, and that really is what fashion is about. I have the best job in the fashion industry, maybe in the entire world. Uh, I invented it, and uh, that is what makes the fashion industry so exciting and so challenging, I think. You may all think you know exactly what you want to do when you finish FIT, but believe me, the fashion world changes so incredibly that the job you may end up excelling in may not even exist today, so you may invent your own job too. That's what makes fashion so exciting and our industry so exciting. Think about the real, true definition of fashion. It's always been true. Fashion is a reflection of the society that wears it. And because our society and our world is ch ever-changing, fashion is ever-changing. My job that I enjoy so much is to pay attention to what's going on in the world at large and see how those changes apply to fashion and communicate that information to you know, our, the Doniger clients and other groups that I speak to. You know, I love speaking to you know, people your age because I think you're so open to new ideas and fashion is always about new ideas. But what I would encourage you to do is Make sure that you keep your interest in broad terms. Don't get too focused on just fashion because you have to know what's going on in the world and then you can figure out what's going to happen in fashion that reflects that world. What I'm going to share with you this afternoon is the current presentation that you know, I'm showing in our offices here on 7th Avenue and also you know, around the world on, on my travels. 
it's a preview of what I believe is going to be important for spring 2011. But we can't just focus on that one season. We have to talk about what's happening now and how it's going to evolve and influence 2011 and beyond that. So let's look at the big picture and think about what's happening in the world and then look at how it affects fashion. First of all, the big picture is changing dramatically because we are living in a different world and our world keeps reinventing itself all the time. The important things to remember in this new world are a new perspective. We have to remember that our main job is to connect to consumers, to provide people with the fashion that expresses the world they live in. I think it's time to rethink trends. You all probably think you know what makes a trend or what the next trend is. Well, I think we have to think about the very definition of trends and whether trends are still trendy. Clue, I think they're not. Okay, uh, I think the most interesting trend of the moment is one we're beginning to experience now, a return to real design, not just styling. And there are certain ongoing attitudes that we need to remind ourselves of, sort of constant mentalities that influence people when they're looking for fashion, when they're shopping, when they're presenting themselves to the world at large. Certainly our new world perspective is so wonderful. You all recognize planet Pandora, I'm sure. I think it's so wonderful now that because of technology we can visualize anything that we can imagine. And I think that makes life so exciting in terms of fashion. We can create new worlds and we can create new people in those worlds. Uh, I loved the technical wizardry of Avatar, even though I think it was kind of a sucky movie. But <laughs> I loved the blue people. And uh, I think if I were uh, you know, a model or a model agent, I would be very, very worried right now, wouldn't you? I don't think we have to go to Russia anymore looking for those tall anorexic girls anymore. You know, I think we can create perfect models and I think that's what will happen. So watch out for that in, in terms of a long range thing. I mean, I can imagine by the end of the, the next decade, we're not going to have real live models at all. We won't need them. We're going to be able to create them and we'll have virtual fashion shows. Forget the tents in Bryant Park or uh, Lincoln Center. The whole world of fashion is changing. Us, we not only can create virtual worlds, we can live in them. Do any of you recognize this site? Raise your hand if you do. I'm very worried about you. Get a life. Okay, uh, this is Farmville. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is a virtual farm site where, where you can actually experience farming. Uh, this, this is for people who love ecology but don't want to get their hands dirty. You know, it's, it's perfect, and it is so obsessive. I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't do this, but my sister does. Uh, she's a housewife and landscape painter in Virginia. And I called her up the other day, and she couldn't speak to me because she said she was so stressed because she had to harvest her artichokes <laughs> on Farmville. So, you know, so I think you know, this is kind of scary when the virtual world becomes more significant to us than the real world. But it's kind of hard to tell the difference now between the virtual world, the imaginary world, and the world we really live in. I remember when I first started seeing the plans for this extraordinary building uh, that they were going to build in Dubai, I just thought, well, this is insane. You know, that nobody should you know, build a building that, that high. Here, I had the, the Times you know, ran, ran all these little you know, film strip kind of exposures of how, as man, we keep trying to go higher and higher and higher. And I, thought, it's never going to happen, it's never going to happen. But as you know, it happened, and there it is. And the top floors of it, you know, our uh, hotel designed by Giorgio Armani. I can tell you for sure I am never going to stay there because I am afraid of heights. <laughs> I don't even like standing up this high, but, uh, you know, I, it's going to fall over. I mean, it's just, you know, it can't work. <laughs> you know. Okay, not only can we imagine things, but we can create things. Certainly the most wonderful artwork of the moment isn't being created with paint and canvas anymore. It's digital artwork, and that exploring of visual images that 
are almost beyond imagination are certainly influencing the way we look at fashion. But let's bring it a little bit home, down to our world. Think about how we now are able to connect to customers. The social revolution, you are all part of it. You're all busy tweeting and communicating with each other in a way that connects you to your peers, but also makes it possible for us to connect fashion to potential customers, too. And we're just beginning to feel our way through that kind of dramatic change. Certainly, technology is moving fashion forward, and that's a uh, snowballing effect that really began many, many years ago with the first synthetic fibers, and it keeps getting more and more exciting. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about celebrities because we have to. It's part of what goes on in our world. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about age, not just because it's my birthday, but because I think you have to remember that not only young people love fashion. And I'm going to rant and rave a little bit about what's wrong with fashion shows today. We're going to talk about seasons. And let's talk a little bit about doing research on the internet, because lots of people in fashion think it's a shortcut to information, and it's not. Be very, very careful. All of the sites that show you Lots and lots of information are wonderful, and you should certainly visit them all the time. But remember, you have to funnel the information that you see on, on sites that especially do street photography, and you have to ask yourself, who did they not photograph? They were photographing the most interesting people, but are those the people that I'm really designing for? Uh, you have to filter all of this information very, very carefully. Uh, remember, just because it's on the internet does not mean that it's true or that it represents a large sector of the population. So uh, don't think it's a shortcut. You still have to get out there yourself and see what's going on, experience it. You know, people always ask me how I do what I do, how I forecast fashion. And you know, there's, uh, the answer is so complicated, but one of the things I do all the time is to observe constantly. I mean, one of the reasons I love coming here to FIT is not just so that you can see my presentation, but so I can see you and see what you're wearing and see w how different you all are today, one to another. Look around at each other and you'll see how fashion has changed today. If, if we were here you know, 17 years ago when I first started coming, you would all be wearing a variation on exactly the same thing. That's how fashion worked then. It doesn't work that way now. So that's information that you need to assimilate all the time in order to think about where fashion is going. Uh, here's a, uh, what came down the runways at D&G's spring 2010 show in Milan. It was, it was pretty good, but the most important thing to look at for me was the audience, because for the first time ever, in the front row were bloggers, sitting right there with Anna Winter, who looks a little bit irritated that, <laughs> you know, that some of the front row seats have been given to these people. Uh, they actually put tables and desks in front of their seats so that they could blog during the show. Uh, take a look at the bloggers. Uh, are they really people who really are experienced in fashion, who really have taste, who really know what's going on, or are they just, you know, smart-ass kids? Uh, that's okay. I like the fact that they're doing that, and I'm excited about it. But remember to, again, weigh that judgment with what you know, what you've been taught, what you can analyze, and don't think just because some 13-year-old is blogging that a show is wonderful, that doesn't mean that it is. One thing that's wonderful about technology is that we can connect to customers that we probably couldn't ever find before. There are lots of little niche marketplaces. I mean, how else could the burkini have become a successful hot item? Couldn't have happened before the internet, but this way, every woman whose religious beliefs mean she has to, be, has to be covered at the beach can find the merchandise that fulfills her fashion need. So that makes technology exciting, too. And it's not news, but there's more and more of it all the time. Technology is creating new test tube textiles all the time. And for spring 2011, watch for fabrics that haven't even existed before. Lots of new foil and poly-coated fabrics that will 
give some of the same tired old designs a totally new look because they'll be made out of something that didn't even exist last season. Here are the two fabrics that were most talked about textiles in Paris last season. They're both at the Lanvin show designed by Albert Elbaz, as you know, but they were technological breakthroughs. Two new fabrics, one a plissé and one a new version of Fortuny pleating, all technologically invented just before the shows. Here, close up so you can see what they look like. They really look like they have been meticulously done by hand, but they are the result of technical wizardry. Let's talk a little bit about celebrities and celebrity exploitation. I bet you don't know who this is, do you? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll show you my favorite picture of Lady Gaga. Meeting the Queen, yeah, I think they are both so weird. I think it's wonderful <laughs> that they are, they are both in the same picture and they could be wearing each other's outfits, you know, it's, it's so peculiar. Uh, we are living in a time of celebrity worship, but I think it's reaching saturation point and the world is getting a little bit bored with it. I am real bored with it because I'm supposed to be a heartbeat ahead of everybody and I wish most celebrities would get put to sleep right now, you know, because I, I don't want to know anything more about them. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many reporters have called me up to ask me about Lady Gaga's fashion influence. I pray she has none. I'm so delighted to look at you and see not a one of you dressed like Lady Gaga, okay? Don't do it, whatever you do, don't do it. Uh, here are some of the hot new potential fashion icons, the people who seem to be influencing what women want to wear and how they want to present themselves and their breasts to the public at large. I'm sure you recognize Kim Kardashian, Rihanna, and Wendy Williams. Uh, I, I'm very excited because I'm, I'm going to meet Wendy Williams <laughs> next week because uh, yeah, I've done this presentation a few times now around the world and the producer for a show called me up the other day and said, we heard you said some nice things about Wendy in Las Vegas. Wouldn't you like to come and meet her? I'm scared, but I'm going. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, do these kind of stars have a real influence? Well, we don't seem to have anybody good to copy. Like Audrey Hepburn's dead, you know, that's a shame. Because I think it would be nicer if people tried to look like Audrey Hepburn instead of Wendy Williams. But times being what they are, uh, you know, we have to say, oh my God, you know, the, the skin tight jumpsuit is a hot fashion because celebrities are wearing it. No, absolutely not. And look at Lady Gaga in that outfit. So weird, you know, you have to study these pictures very, very carefully, and if you look carefully, you'll see why there are those nasty rumors that she might be a guy. <laughs> okay, those celebrities are important in the fashion industry, but they're not really meaningful. Recently, a survey was done to find out which celebrities are the most influential in terms of making money for companies who manage to use them as endorsers. And here are the three most important women in the world of consumerism. Ellen DeGeneres, Angelina Jolie, and Oprah Winfrey. But remember, the celebrity has to match the brand. It has to be a good marriage. Angelina jo Jolie and St. John were not a good match. So the deal fell apart, of course. However, you know, despite the fact that these ladies are pretty you know, influential, they're not the top three on the list of the 10 most important influential celebrities. They're less important than these three guys. Interestingly enough, these men can command more money because they are more influential in the consumer world. Brad Pitt, Will Smith, and Johnny Depp, who of course uh, you may know in the People's Choice Awards was named the most popular movie star in the world. Is, I think that's pretty good. Have you all seen Alice in Wonderland yet? Isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's so, it's so imaginative and stuff. Is it going to be a fashion influence? Of course not. I hope you all read the style pages of the New York Times a couple weeks ago. Ruth LaFerla, who's one of their best reporters, wrote a very brilliant column about how movies no longer directly influence fashion. And I think that's, that's certainly true. And celebrities, you know, uh, come and go just the way movies do. 
it's important to remember that, you know, a celebrity can be important one day and then make one little mistake or many little mistakes and be worthless. Let's talk about age for a minute because this is, this is really an important lesson that the fashion industry just has not learned. Uh, most people in fashion think, you know, after about age 18 or above size double zero, you don't matter much. Well, that's not true. Uh, women, o American women over 50 are worth $19 trillion of the economy right now. That means they have more spending power and discretionary income than any other U.S. group. Now, I've been in the fashion business a while, and believe me, this is something most fashion designers and fashion companies don't want to acknowledge at all. And they will tell you, uh, women over 50 don't, aren't interested in fashion, they don't buy anything. Bull. They would buy things if they had sleeves, if they covered their butts, and it's not the truth anyway, because last year, American women over 50 spent $19 billion on apparel. So they are a very, very important market sector. Uh, you know, and here is, you know, Diane Sawyer, who at 62, you know, is still kind of a hot babe, but she's not the only one. You may not recognize Raquel Welch, because you're not old enough to remember when she was a hot star, but she's not bad now, sh and she's 70 years old, and I happen to, you know, like that a lot since I'll be 70 next year. And I want whoever photoshopped her picture to photoshop mine, okay? <laughs> that, that, that's just, uh, but uh, she's a dynamic woman. She, ha she has, as you may know, a wig company, and she works very, very closely supplying wigs to cancer victims. So she's a good lady, too. Uh, she's not my absolute favorite, though. I have someone who's more of an inspiration. Are you ready? On May 31st, he's going to be 80 years old. Yeah. And he's still, he's still like a dude. And I think the most exciting thing is that he's still creative, still working, still making magnificent movies. So I think, you know, I've, I've got another 10 years to come and talk, Alice. So I'll, I'll, I'll be here 10 years from now. I, you guys won't be. Okay, let's talk about fashion shows and creativity and artistry. Uh, here's a view from Alexander McQueen's extraordinary last fashion show. Certainly a brilliant fashion show. Very, very sad occasion, of course, because it was his last. Was Alexander McQueen a great designer? I think not. I think he was a great showman. I think he was a great artist. But he didn't do what a great designer does. And Coco Chanel, who knew everything, said, it isn't fashion until people on the street are wearing it. And people on the street never embraced what Alexander McQueen did, despite it should have been in galleries and museums, which is where most of it is now. Uh, this is his last show, of course, which you've probably seen pictures of. And he, uh, he explained to the press that his inspiration was alien reptiles. Now, how many women do you know want to get dressed on Saturday night to go out looking like an alien reptile? You see, it's a concept that doesn't really move the merch, and that really is what this is all about. Let's talk about fashion shows for a minute because they've become so extraordinary. They are about entertainment, and they are not about moving the merch. And it's not just women's wear fashion shows. Here is a men's wear fashion show in Milan last season, Montclair, designed by Tom Brown, uh, with you know, a million models who came out into this, you know, big arena dressed in capes, discarded the capes, dove into the pool, and swam a fashion show. Uh, did this have anything to do with moving merchandise? Absolutely not, but it had a lot to do with brand awareness, which is kind of the whole thing. And as long as you can differentiate between entertainment and real merchandise, you're okay, and you can take these for what they're worth. If this is a little too damp for you, uh, the menswear season also had a very dry show. This was the Kenzo menswear show in Paris, and those glass bottles that you see suspended there uh, above the audience were filled with sand. And for the finale, as the models came out to, uh, for their final walk, the bottles were wired to tilt, and sand came flowing down uh, right on the front. It was not a fun show to be in the front row of, I can tell you that, you know, it was insane. Uh, let's talk about something that's going on in the world of fashion shows that bothers me a lot. 
uh, you know, designers are anxiously, you know, getting the word out, and many fashion shows, like the Burberry show by Christopher Bailey in London last season, was live streamed on the internet. I keep thinking, is this such a great idea? Should we be showing customers clothes that they aren't going to be able to buy for six months? Is that really smart? Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't think it is. And Christopher Bailey also did something that made it even more stupid. Uh, I don't mince words, okay? He had duplicate samples made and he gave them to the celebrities who were going to be sitting in the front row. So when you went to this show, there was Gwyneth Paltrow sitting in an outfit that then came down the runway. So, you know, so we can get what's going on, but do you think you know, the person who on the internet is seeing this show live stream can figure out what the hell this means? You know, are these clothes for sale now? Who's wearing them? Are they old? Well, you know, what's going on? Uh, I, th I think we need to rethink some of this. Another thing I think we need to rethink in the industry, and since you are all going to be in the industry, I hope you can change it if it hasn't already changed when you get your first big job. It's the idea of seasons and seasonal deliveries, delivering stuff at the wrong time. We all live in a buy now, wear now society. When you buy something, you want to wear it right now. You don't want to wait three months to wear it, and yet we deliver summer clothes in January. We deliver fall, fall clothes in July. Uh, take a look at all these clothes. They're all by Calvin Klein, uh, uh, Francisco Costa, of course, designer, and they all look pretty terrific. Are they all from the same show or the same season? Ah, surprise, surprise, take a look. They are, you know, years apart. Who knows when they were delivered? Who? It doesn't matter. They're all to be worn whenever you want to wear them. So we need to change the traditional fashion calendar. Uh, let's talk for a minute about fast fashion, because I, I love fast fashion. I'm sure you do, too. I think H&M and Zara are miraculous in what, for what they do. And uh, everybody in the industry thinks it's such a great idea. They're all trying to be very fast. Well, I don't think fast is really the secret of the success. I think fabulous is what makes it successful because I think most people going into H&M can't identify that Stella McCartney just sent this you know, pair of pants down the runway six weeks ago. I don't think that matters. What matters it's not is that it's not the same boring merchandise that's in every store across the country. They differentiate. And I think one of the messages right now is differentiate or die because nobody but nobody wants to buy more of the same old stuff. So I think that's something department stores have to rethink very seriously because they are all over inventoried with the same old stuff. Uh, let's talk about trends for a minute. Uh, and, and this is a subject very near and dear to my heart uh, because I, I'm kind of the trend guy. I helped invent trending as we now think of it. Here are, here are some shots from the, the, the runway season for spring and uh, trends. Do you think anybody's going to wear any of that? No. So why do we think it's a trend? Why do we bother even looking at things that are no longer relevant to today's fashion system? I want to tell you a little bit about fashion history because I am so old, I lived through most of it. Okay? This is how trends started. This is the guy who started trends. Kenzo, Kenzo Takada came from Tokyo to Paris late in the 1970s and opened a little boutique. Uh, he very, very quickly became the most important, most influential designer in fashion during those years. Kenzo Takada invented what we think of as trends today because every single Kenzo fashion show was an event. And before that, fashion shows had been so boring you could like sleep through them all. And Kenzo is the one who invented the kind of shows that we now take for granted as fashion shows. Music, exuberance, uh, fabulous photographic models. And every single show had clear-cut, head-to-toe themes that people called trends, and every season they were great. There was a scene he did the Irish trend that was all in Donegal tweeds. Uh, then he did the Gatsby trend, and it was like the Riviera in the 1930s. He did the peasant trend long before Salon did. Uh, he was the first person I remember to mix patterns in this very strange way that we now accept as you know the skill that every stylist has. Uh, he could make a 
fabric into a trend. One season he used all imported Dutch cottons from Indonesia and they became the hottest thing in fashion. Often his trends were influenced by Asia, his own cultural background, of course. He did the military look, and do you recognize that young woman? That's Jerry Hall, who became Mick Jagger's, uh, well, the mother of Mick Jagger's children, so I don't quite know what that makes her, uh, besides hot. Uh, and when Kenzo did a theme, he did it head to toe, and that's the way people bought it then. And nobody, but nobody buys trends that way anymore. When he did the African look, they were African fabrics worn with African jewelry and African shoes. It wouldn't happen today. When he did the pirate look, same deal. And how about, you know, when he did the Native American look? Now, the whole fashion system was different then. Think back. This is er, in the 70s. There was no internet. These shows, you had to know what was going on at the Kenzo show if you were in the business at all because that was, he was dictating the trends literally. And if you couldn't get into the Kenzo show, boy, were you in trouble because uh, you just didn't know. There was no internet. Photographers were not allowed into the shows in those early days. So how did the, how did the trend get out there? Well, I spread the news. So right after the, the, um, the Native American trend, you know, I did what I did in Paris in those days. Because I was an illustrator, I could go to the shows and sketch every single outfit that came down the runway, which is a great way to practice, by the way. You will fine tune your eye uh, in no other other way. And then what would happen is we'd go back to uh, my hotel room in Paris and I'd sketch like mad. We'd write, handwrite these little things. Uh, there were no computers, no laptops, remember. They were then Xeroxed in some little hole in the wall copy place in Paris. And we had messengers who then went to the hotels of all of our clients in Paris. And while they were sleeping, we slid these newsletters every single day of the shows under their hotel doors. That was kind of a primitive internet when you think about it. You know, we did the, we were live streaming but with paper. It was so exciting and it really worked and it is now ancient fashion history. It just does not work that way anymore. Although a lot of people, a lot of designers and a lot of fashion companies are still using this system, but it isn't working anymore. Here's what is the next way to look at trends. True trends the return of real design. That means we are going to look for directional changes in silhouette and construction, and that's where trend will come. We are going to look at how colors change, and that becomes a trend. We're going to focus on certain fabrics I as a fashion statement season by season, and they will become a trend. Now, lots of people will still give them silly, cute names like, you know, Elvis Presley's funeral trend or something like that, you know, uh, forget it. These are really the three elements that will create fashion excitement. The first trend is all about construction. Here is the very, very famous Charles James Shamrock gown and a diagram of how it was constructed. I, I can't imagine how uncomfortable it is. I can't imagine how you actually live in that. Uh, and that photograph on the left is, is absolutely true. The dress is so heavily constructed, you don't have to put it on a mannequin. It stands by itself. And there are some Charles James gowns here at FIT in the Costume Museum, of course, and I think you can access them for research. They are amazing to look at. Uh, could a gown be made today? Could an outfit be made today? that's as design sensitive and exciting, but be modern and practical? Well, at first you might think no, but the answer is really yes. I think the possibilities are wonderful. Here is a modern interpretation of Charles James' kind of design sensitivity. The construction trends at the moment are the beginning of a return to an appreciation of shape and design in silhouette for its own sake. And that represents a big change because for about the last 20 years, fashion has been all about the body as the shape of fashion. And now we are talking about exploring the airspace between the fabric and the body. It's all about fabric manipulation. Seeming can be a very, very important trend. What I'm saying here, if you think about it, is that we are reaching saturation point with embellishment and design detail. 
And so we're looking for something new. And this is the beginning of it. Draping, of course, has been around for a few seasons now, and I see that continuing very, very importantly. But it's really about sculpting with fabric, creating these new silhouettes that I think will generate some real excitement. We've started to see that. Certainly, if you watch the red carpet of the Academy Awards, you saw some incredibly sculpted clothes, some of them not too flattering, but all of them very exciting. And I think there are, will be ways to make that into a much more palatable commercial kind of direction for fashion. And remember, when you're designing, this is designing in the round. So it's not just a flat sketch of the front view of a garment. You have to really sculpt it on, on the body. You, know, there, you have to make a toile. You have to drape. And remember, you're working in three dimensions. So the back of a garment is equally challenging as the front. Here, another construction detail, cutting and piecing together. These are uh, actually from the collection at the Costume Institute, uh, one by Adrian, one by Elizabeth Hawks. Uh, putting fabrics together in this way is something that designers are beginning to experiment with now. I don't think these are quite as beautiful as the ones you just looked at, but you've got the idea that people are mixing these abstract collages of fabrics together, cut and piecing fabrics and textures and colors together. Let's look at the ongoing attitudes, the things that are bigger than trends that keep us finding new creative expressions in fashion. The mainstream mentalities, what's going on in the heads of consumers? Well, one thing that's going on always, and we simply have to figure out how it's being interpreted every season, is our need for dreams. Uh, an idyllic fantasy world, uh, and we all indulge in that in different ways, and at different times it affects fashion differently. And certainly there are people who love to be on the cutting edge, on the edge of a precipice, and we have to keep m finding new ways to make that edge seem new and exciting, and that's a real challenge. But most people, most modern people today, uh, aren't as obsessed with fashion as those of us in this room are, and they really want modern, comfortable, easy clothes that suit their lifestyle, but they can be fashionable too. Let's l think for a moment about you know, that sort of dreamscape that exists in our everyone's subconscious and, and how it affects fashion. It's one reason that we keep dipping into the past, looking at antique fashions and vintage fashions and bringing those dreams to life in a modern way. And it, at the Doniger Group, like every forecasting company, it's our job to create color palettes that express these ongoing mentalities. Here are a couple of palettes designed for spring 2011. These very, very pale dreamlike colors, just almost white, but just a hint of a tint, or maybe tender mid-tones that are, are very genteel and very, very feminine. And that same dreamlike quality then influences textiles as well. You've got three levels of interpretation always. You have the color emphasis, the textile expression, and then the design execution. And so if you think you're working in this big sort of ballpark picture of, okay, w w what fantasy dreams can we express without looking silly? Uh, think about how sheer fabrics are part of this. Sheer fabrics in tinted colors, in planes, in textures, in prints. They give anything that you make out of them a very dreamy kind of quality. Of course, these sheer fabrics are a bit tricky to wear, so to commercialize it, you have to think about them as sheer overlays on top of opaque fabrics or underneath opaque fabrics, a sheer layer like a cloud. And when you first look at these, you can't imagine that they are knits, but they really are because knits are now so featherweight that they drape as uh, almost like gossamer chiffon. Everything becomes influenced by these mainstream mentalities. Think about sweater knits or knitted fabrics by the yard and how they are being influenced. So for spring, we're looking for more open stitch knits that are lacy and airy, almost semi-sheer. Springtime, of course, we have florals. It wouldn't be spring without a flower. 
the big message here, when you look at it, is that there is no big message. In previous times, I would have been standing up here saying, well, spring is going to be the season of the rose or the season of the daisy, and everything would be a variation on that theme. Well, we can't say that anymore because that isn't how fashion works anymore. So springtime, flowers, yes. You want to know the most important flowers? Tiny, itsy-bitsy ones will get a buzz. So will gigantic nosegays. But there will be plenty of room in the middle for just about every other kind of flower you can think of. Many of these dreamy prints are like a dream you've half forgotten, half remembered, kind of blurry, diffused, airbrushed, uh, prints you can't quite describe but that are just lovely. Our dream landscape often takes us to exotic, faraway places. This isn't new in fashion, of course. For the last two centuries, we've been inspired by Asia or Hawaii or Paris. But now there's a difference. Here you can see a sort of heavy-handed interpretation of the inspiration. But what it really boils down to in a modern sense is probably just print, pattern, and color. These are not native costumes by a long shot. Uh, you know, it's not an, an African print uh, for an African draped garment. It's not a s an Indian paisley done into a sari. So we're taking these inspirations and making sure that we modify them and make them modern and wearable and applicable to today's life. So here, this multiculturalism has given rise to a whole bunch of wonderful prints, and none of them are authentic. So you do your research, and you make your own interpretation of it. Another attitude that is so important is just the attitude of taking it easy. And that means a very sort of optimistic 1950s vibe, classic sportswear, the American look that has really become the global look. It's our gift to the world, I think. Classic American elitism. This is, you know, the, the world of Ralph Lauren, really. And for spring 2011, uh, Ralph is probably going to go to the sea and fish. And you're going to see a lot of fisherman knits and, and uh, denim and stuff like that. Uh, this is all about effortless comfort. Here are clothes that are definitely not challenging, clothes that are practical. Now, there's nothing new about this. You know, you can call it safari, you can call it military, you can call it utility. You know, we call it all those things. Uh, but it really is just a softer version of workwear. And that's what makes it very different. It, to make things modern, we have followed the lead that Giorgio Armani started early in the 1970s when he started deconstructing clothes and taking out all of the interfacings and the linings and things to make the clothes the kind of lightweight, comfortable clothes that we all enjoy wearing today. Uh, for this classic look, you know, of course, we have classic colors. And by the way, when you're looking at these color palettes, uh, they all have stupid names. I, I, I w do not take any credit for these stupid names. Color people just talk this language that is kind of a dead language like Latin, but they all talk it to each other, or most of them do. Uh, here in these uh, same things are a whole new generation of neutrals that are often lightened with uh, very, very light tinted neutrals. And in fact, the neutrals are so important that they're really influencing a lot of people's thinking. Here, some neutralized prints and uh, all in neutral colors, and they all look pretty exciting. And something that lots of people are doing is taking their colored prints from last season and just recoloring them in shades of neutral color together to move and s inch them along slowly. Everybody says that fashion's moving faster than ever. I disagree. I think fashion is moving at a snail's pace at the moment because everything is in fashion, so we have no real trajectory moving forward. I don't think that's bad, because I think people are very concerned about many other things. So they want fashion that's evolutionary rather than revolutionary. And hey, wouldn't be fashion without denim. Uh, the new thing in denim, the most controversial thing, and I find it hard to believe this is controversial, is wearing denim head to toe. Denim tops and denim bottoms together. Talk about a yawn, but uh, everybody in the denim business is very excited about this. No wonder they can sell two pieces instead of just one. And it's not just you know, one certain wash that's in style, uh, many, many washes, and, and it also extends into chambray and wa just wash canvas. Uh, more exciting to my way of thinking is all-American chino and 
cotton khaki. And I think uh, a lot of you who probably spend most of your life in denim will be wearing khakis by next spring 2011 instead. Because we're talking classics, some of this stuff is so old that it looks new again. Here, very, very simple stripes. And please notice again that we can't dictate any one stripe or any one width or any one color stream. Uh, we have to offer options. Here's one that hasn't been around for a while that's about to pop up again, optic polka dots. And whereas in the past they probably would have been white aspirin dots on navy blue or black, now they're multicolored and random placed and in many, many different scales. Because this is so clean cut and all American, country checks are a part of this look. But notice they're often not on the kind of cotton that you would expect, but they're on shears or they're on something soft or, so or often even knitted. Career dressing is something that is having a big revival in terms of fashion. For a long time, we have been encouraging working women to dress like they're going to the beach or nightclubs when they go to work. Well, that's coming to an end, maybe because there is a shortage of jobs and people who are working want to present themselves in a more polished, professional way. So we're seeing a return to more traditional career dressing, although it's often in lighter weight fabrics, often in very crisp, clean cut, polished cotton. So this is practicality that becomes profitable. Linen and linen blends are also part of this interest we have in everything natural and comfortable. And of course, if you've ever worn linen, you know uh, traditionally the big objection is, oh, it wrinkles so easily. Well, forget about that because we love wrinkles. And wrinkles and crinkles and puckers are all part of an ongoing story in fashion. And most of these are the result of new textile technology. Let's talk about the cutting edge, because I'm sure there are some of you who want to be on the cutting edge, the edge of the precipice. Well, th that's gotten kind of boring, hasn't it? Because everybody who's on the edge looks the same way they've looked on the edge for the last 10 years. You know, bikers, goths, vampires, always in black, head to toe, always kind of trying to look scary. Well, it's becoming a bit passe. And in fact, it's just an ongoing subculture. I remember the first punk I ever saw. I was living and working in London, uh, and I think it must have been about 1971 when I first saw my first punk come down the King's Road, you know, with you know, bondage pants and a mohawk and a burned T-shirt and a safety pin in his nose. I thought he was fabulous. And I you know, had him photographed, I took, I took him to the studio and said, well, we must take your picture. I sent it out in a report to all of my clients, and guess what? I got so much hate mail and cancellations, and people said, are you mad? M people are never going to dress this way. Well, that, you know, that's, that's the price you have to pay for recognizing things a little bit too early on. So uh, it, you know, it satisfies a cultural need to, to be on the edge of that precipice. But you know, what's going to be new about it for spring 2011? Well, watch for a lot of edgy people to kind of be adding uh, elements of protective armor to their clothes, a, a, a lot, of, lot of heavy metal that's not just studs or nail heads, but chain mail and, and, and hooks and metal plates and things. Uh, is it going to make a lot of money? Is it going to change the world? No. Uh, think about lots of clothes that look like they've been dis destroyed, like the world has come to an end. And we all know, if you saw the movie, the world is not going to come to an end in 2011. It's going to come to an end in 2012. So you've got a whole year to wear these clothes. Uh, the part of the, the edgy look that I think is the most important and the one that's probably going to kick in is the steampunk subculture. I hope you all know what steampunk is. It's kind of a mix of, of vintage Victorian and disintegration and rusty industrialism. Uh, if you, uh, it started out uh, really as a fashion movement, and, and now there is steampunk music. Uh, there's uh, some steampunk art. Uh, it's, it's ready to start moving into mainstream awareness, I think. And in fact, there is a steampunk movie. Any of you who saw the Robert Downey Jr. movie Sherlock Holmes saw a visualization of steampunk uh, as an art direction for that film. 
Uh, black is still the edgiest color you can possibly own. But take a look at all these clothes. They're not same old, same old. So I think if you're going to buy something black or design something black, it better be very, very new in terms of design or in terms of textiles. How about a hot, edgy detail? Cutouts and slashes. Now, slashes were very big in about 1412 in fashion. And so this is not a new idea. I have a feeling there is no such thing as a new idea in fashion. All we have to do is revive the right idea, the right old idea at the right new time. Watch out for this. Everybody who was wearing black sort of punk goth stuff, you know, and now realizes that that no longer is shocking, has this new option. And some of the trendiest, farthest out people are starting to dress in a whole lot of color and lots of humor. It's like the circus has come to town. This one will really get you noticed, I promise you. And you're going to see some influences begin to trickle into fashion. For example, this is where the digital art prints uh, one way to wear a whole lot of color without looking, you know, like you don't know anything about fashion. So, wonderful, wonderful digital art prints. And, of course, a new color palette of new way of looking at bright color that could be edgy. Let's wrap up with a reality check. The real world, it's so easy to understand. Most people want easy, casual clothes. There is a new growing interest in looking a bit more sophisticated and chic. And if you want to know what my long range forecast is, we're talking like five years out probably, it's for precision cut simplicity. Here, an example of the easy casual comfort. There's nothing sloppy about it. It's just comfortable, it's casual, it's real, and it looks new. And sophisticated styles starting to pick up on some very subtle, more adventuresome experimentation in terms of shaping. And this is what I'm in love with at the moment, so that means you couldn't give it away in most stores. Absolutely precision cut, so simple, no embellishment, no sequins, no cargo pockets, no straps, no buckles, no nothing. Just absolute cleansing of the visual palette as we get ready for new decade. We're on starting on the second decade of the 21st century, and it's about time we do something new. Before I wrap up, I know there are uh, some questions that we're bound to hear, so I can give you the answers before you ask the questions. Uh, yes, you can apply for my job, but I'm not going to die soon, <laughs> and it won't be available for a minute. But there are internships available in the Doniger Group. They're highly, highly coveted, so I want to warn you about that. If you want to send your resume to our HR lady, she's in charge of all the internships, here's her email address. Her name is Mary Ann Moore. Her email address is mmore, M-O-O-R-E, at doniger, D-O-N-E-G-E-R, dot com. Okay, uh, I can't promise you anything, but that's, the, the, that's how you do it. Uh, I'm usually asked how I do what it is that I do, and I, ha I have two answers. One that uh, is a smart-ass answer I love giving, and it's absolutely true, I swear. My grandmother was a gypsy fortune teller. Absolutely true. And so I think there's something in my DNA, maybe. But I think the real answer is that I have a, I have a real curiosity about life and people and why people choose to present themselves in the way they do. And I like looking at those forces. I'm, I'm passionately curious about a lot of things. I like watching reality TV, you know. Uh, I like reading tabloid magazines, but I still like reading good literature. I like studying politics and demographics, uh, riding the subway and looking at what everybody's wearing and thinking, why did they buy that? How much did they pay for it? What do they want to buy next? So that's, that's really how to do it. If you want to know what kind of skills it takes to be a fashion trend forecaster, number one is that curiosity I just mentioned. Number two is communication skills. You have to be able to write. You have to be able to talk. Uh, maybe you have to be able to sketch a little bit so that you can visualize your ideas. Uh, I, I have a kind of unique brain, I guess, because I think I'm kind of equally balanced between left and right brain. And, uh, 
there are two different worlds in fashion, and you really have to be able to have a foot in each world. There's the creative world, and there's the business world, and they come together to make the fashion into an industry. So you have to be able to speak both of those languages fluently. If you want to know how I invented fashion forecasting, uh, it, it's a very simple story, a nice one. I was working in London as a fashion illustrator, and the world was changing, the fashion world was changing. Everybody was coming to grips with understanding that they had to look at the world at large instead of just look at Paris high fashion haute couture collections, which is how the fashion world got its information for a century. Well, in the 1960s, that started to change, and fashion started coming from the streets. That was such a an alien idea to the fashion industry. Nobody knew how to tap into that information. So those of us who, mostly American expatriates who were living in Europe, started getting requests from old friends we had in the rag trade in America, designers or retailers or manufacturers saying, could you tell us what's going on in the boutiques? W what are the kids in London wearing to the clubs? You know, what's, what's happening? So we started doing little newsletters and those, that was the beginning of what we now call fashion service companies, and there still are about a dozen of them in the world. Uh, it didn't take long, though, before the people who were receiving those newsletters said, uh, it's great to for you to tell me what's happening now, but can't you tell me what's gonna happen next? And I discovered I had a real knack for recognizing what's gonna happen next. I could go to a nightclub, you know, and see you know, two people dressed in medieval clothes and think, oh my God, that's going to be the next big thing, and I was usually right. Uh, another question I'm often asked is, if I'm ever wrong, no. <laughs> uh, I'm never wrong, but sometimes my timing is bad. <laughs> I think, I think that's, uh, that's the key to success in fashion. It's all about timing. We all know what's going to happen, you know? It's gonna go up, it's gonna go down, it's gonna go in, it's gonna go out. Uh, when, that's the trick. And experience and research will help you with that. Now, if you can think of a question I haven't answered already, shoot. Don't be shy. Put your hand up. Yes. No, I, th I think they need to know anything goes, and they need to know which anything it is. And, uh, and the, the thing that's interesting about fashion forecasting at the moment that's even making it m more interesting than it, than it always was is that you have to know your specific client because those two women you just described each bought something at a store manufactured by someone, and they knew exactly what they would respond to. So now, whenever I have a meeting with a client, I spend a lot of time asking them questions so I can figure out wh who their customer is and where that customer is at in terms of the, the ongoing fashion cycle. So I think, that I think there's going to be more of a need for a new kind of fashion forecasting, which is really what we're seeing evolve and which when we talk about the death of trends, because that's the old way. And the new way is really much more a tailored one-on-one -on -one fashion consultancy that then sort of handholds and guides specific companies or designers into the next trend that maybe only applies to them. You know, it no longer applies to everybody. Okay. Yes. I used to. I used to be the worst fashion victim in the world. I can. I cannot tell you. I've gotten gotten so sensible in my old age. But uh, you know, like, I, I had the first male perm that Vidal Sassoon ever did in London. I had ringlets. It was in, it was incredible. I, I, I had the worst accident in my life when I fell down the subway steps in London because I was wearing Python platform boots that were about this hi this high, you know, and I fell all the way down the escalator. So uh, so that yeah, re it really hurts. And th there was a, a season when Karl Lagerfeld decreed that everyone should wear sort of three mufflers at once. And I actually went to the fashion shows and sat in the front row sweating my brains out in, th in three mufflers. So, uh, so now, I, and, and I, I honestly think you know, that a lot of people are doing you know, what I'm doing now, especially boomers, uh, 
who are burned out by fashion. So I think they're, they're downsizing and looking to buy fewer but more expensive and enduring timeless pieces. Uh, but that's certainly not everybody. But so don't judge me for the way I look now. I'm, I'm embarrassed to be a fashion person looking like this. Any other questions? Yes. One of, one of the most exciting you know, moments of, of sort of epiphany I ever had, I was once doing you know, this kind of shtick at my office, and uh, at, at the office, the, the, people, the people who come to the shows are, are either paying clients of the Doniger Group, or people pay, I think it's $50 a ticket to come and, and see these things at my office. And there I saw sitting <laughs> next to each other, the des people from the design studio at Walmart sitting next to people from Donna Karen's design studio. And I thought this is so interesting that they can, uh, they can be exposed to the same, mer same information and take it back to their own businesses and interpret it in a totally, obviously, a totally different way, yet basing their thinking on, on, on some of the information that I gave them. Uh, I, I speak to a lot of student groups, and as I told you earlier, student groups are, are, are my favorites to talk to. But uh, you know, I, uh, my most challenging clients at the moment, and, and this, is, this is a whole new sector, I now spend a lot of time working with financial analysts. And God, are they boring. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but they, they need to know about fashion uh, because so many companies are publicly traded. And they need to understand if somebody has a good collection or somebody's store is looking good, that those are the stocks that they should be advising people to buy. Conversely, if you know if Donna Karen's collection lays an egg, then they're going to think, well, you know, maybe you know this will will not be tipped to be a, a hot collection. Uh, uh, often I'm asked who my favorite designer is, so I, uh, I can tell you it's Vivian Westwood. She's been my favorite for a long time. Not that I believe everything she does is perfect, but the thing I love about her, and, I, and I've known her you know, since she began her career, was that she thinks, and she always has a reason. Most, most designers, when you say, why did you make that? You know, they don't know. They have just had a gut feeling. She always has a brilliant, sometimes very complex reason for every, everything she does. And at her, at her recent menswear show, I, th I thought it was so brilliant and so uh, such a statement about fashion. Uh, when you went into the show, the runway was covered with flattened cardboard boxes taped together with duct tape. And, and on the stage was this you know, sort of refrigerator-sized cardboard box. And then you know, the music started, the, the lights went down, and a spotlight shone on the box, which started to move. And this male model came crawling out, dr looking like a bag man, you know, and he was wearing awful, awful clothes in lots of layers, and he added some more, and he you know, wrapped a blanket around himself and walked down the runway. And that was such a heavy statement. You know, I loved it. Not that you know, I think everybody should dress like a bag man or a bag lady, but you know, I, th I thought it was a you know, brilliant concept. OK, yes. I, I am obsessed with Brazil, um, and th I, I think the interesting thing that we're going to see in the globalization of fashion, not, not just in South America or, or Asia, uh, is the, sh the, the shift of the balance of power away from the tr traditional uh, Western Euro-American influence. Uh, I think where a fashion forecasting company is based no longer matters, because I think every fashion forecasting company is based on the internet. I think, uh, I mean, uh, I, I work with, you know, our, our, our stringers, you know, all, all around the world, and I get their information on a daily basis. But I think the, the interesting thing is that everybody you know, can feed their, their central office information via the Internet so that, you know, we know, you know, like, uh, you know, I get instant pictures from the Rio collections, you know, uh, you know every, every season. 
So, but I think uh, it's very, very interesting to chart the demographic changes in, uh, in, in not just you know, emerging countries, but also the demographic shifts in consumerism within you know, established consumer uh, landscapes. No, I think you know the certainly the the uh, the Latin American influence on fashion in America, which then therefore influences European fashion, which then influences. I mean, you, you can you can start following these nationalistic influences throughout the world. So I, th I think you know the the globalization of fashion I is is not quite a, a fait accompli yet, but I think by the end of the decade it will be. I th the thing that makes me sad uh, is that I think. Everything is becoming so global that there is almost no difference. I used to love traveling because you know you'd step off the plane in Milan and everybody looked different than the people in Paris, and then you'd step off the plane in Hong Kong and everybody looked different. Uh, and now it's like it's interchangeable, which is kind of cool but also boring. Yes. Good question. No, I don't. I, th I think we're going to clearly understand the difference. And I think there will be shows that are entertainment, and they're like Las Vegas or Broadway, and I think they will be open to the general public maybe, and maybe we'll have to pay for them, and maybe we won't. But they will have nothing whatsoever to do with the clothes that they are actually sold, which is indeed the way you know, McQueen worked. I mean, his clothes are like terrific and beautiful and wonderfully tailored, but they're not the ones you see on the runway. And that's true with most fashion shows. One reason that you know I, I like the New York shows so much, despite the fact they're the most boring, is that you're actually seeing most of the clothes that you know are actually going to end up in a store or possibly end up in a store. And you can't say that at all about Paris. You can say it about uh, maybe 50% of what you see in Milan. But I, th I think I, th I think you know long range. Because <laughs> I, ju I just did a, uh, an, an interview about what fashion is going to be like in 2020, and. Uh, and and my, my best guess is that we are going to see it break away because I think we've, we've just, we're ending an extraordinary period of democracy in fashion when just about everybody was influenced and interested in fashion. And I don't think that's going to remain. I think by 2020, fashion with a capital F you know, the, uh, is going to be a very much a uh, restricted elitist interest in the same way that opera is a, a niche interest and yet pop music is universal. I think we will have high fashion as an elitist pursuit like, like art or opera, and then we will have apparel which will be subject to you know, changes and, and influences, but not cross-pollinating with the high fashion. And the high fashion will be the, 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 what we think of as now the, the entertaining fashion shows. Yes, one more. My guess is that they, they will still be very important for that elitist thing, but they, if they want to uh, influence the masses, then they, they will have to have a diffusion brand. I think we will have hugely powerful brands uh, like Walmart. You know, uh, so I don't think a brand has to be a luxury brand. I think, I think brands will continue to be important because of the, the great mass of merchandise that's out there. And when you think about it, you know, the, the reason that we all like brands is they help us to make a selection, something that we can believe in or, or relate to or understand. So I think there will always be a real hunger for brands, and I think they will be from uh, elitist luxury brands down to you know, a, 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 a mass brand and that will be important. I think the problem that we've seen is that when a, a brand like Louis Vuitton tries to uh, cross over, 
because uh, we've just come through an extraordinary time when people who never should have been buying luxury brands were trying to buy luxury brands, usually with you know credit that they you know really couldn't afford. So uh, I, I think the entire brand landscape is shifting, and it will be very, very interesting to watch what happens over the next 10 years. Okay, thank you so much for allowing me to speak to you. It's a great pleasure.